coaches, athletes, welcome. Thank you for the uh, privilege of uh, being here and letting me talk about this issue for a few minutes. Uh, the issue of origins. Where in the world did you come from? And where in the world are you going? Is a remarkably important topic. In fact, if you believe in the Bible today, it is so important that God began the book he gave us with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how important he thought it was. If you'll give me 25 minutes, maybe 30 at the outset, um, I want to try to tell you how important this, this particular topic is because I'm sure if you think about the subject of creation and evolution, and all that kind of thing, you might be thinking, why is it even important? What is everybody so worked up about? I want to tell you what, there are a lot of people really worked up about this. It is a prominent issue in our culture. It has ramifications that run through our lives in profound kind of ways. I'd like to show you some of that as I go through this, but the subject is really deep, really wide, it takes a long time to really come to terms with it all. All I can do here today is kind of like whet your appetite a little bit for it and to try to help you understand how important it is and get you engaged in this issue, this topic, because people see it differently. And if you are new to faith, as Coach Kevin said, you you got to realize this is the place of foundation. And maybe you've never set this foundation, you're a believer, but you uh, have never set this foundation. And then those of you who've been through schools of one kind or another, particularly in a public secular school setting, you've been taught something very different for a long time other than biblical creationism. You've been taught and inculcated in the thinking of secular humanism and this thing called evolution. So how did we get here? And why is that important? If you give me 25 minutes, I will answer that question for you. <coughs> I will help you know why that's important to you with one statement at the end. I'll share some stuff with you about all this as time goes on, but if you, if you give me those 25 minutes, if you've ever wondered what is the big deal about this, you know that schools fuss about this and boards of education are struggling with all this issue and you hear uh, people speak on one side then you hear people speak on the other side and you, you think, what are, what are we to believe? Who, who is to know? If you give me those 25 minutes, I will guarantee that I can show you that it has significance and importance for your life. The way you answer that question will determine the way you live the rest of your life. Where did you come from? And where are you going? This question is important for how you will live your life. And this question is important for your eternal destiny. The destiny of you for all eternity may depend on how you answer this question, how you form your thinking around this question. Because I want you to understand that the origin controversy, the issue of where we came from as mankind, as the human race, is really a struggle uh, with two predominant ideologies, philosophies, or worldviews. And uh, it's either based on one that is natural, or it's based on one that is supernatural. It's based on one in, in terms of uh, what you've been taught about evolution, and how it all came to be, or it has to do with that which is supernatural. And I'm just going to be up front with you and tell you, if you buy into this book, like I do. Believe this book like I do. This is a book that is based on supernaturalism. Miracles. Supernatural power. Different than what the rest of the world shows us in its natural processes. So when you come to discuss uh, where we came from and the origin of life, you will find out right at, right at the uh, start of it. You have a decision to make. I'm never going to tell you what to you believe what your heart tells you to believe, but you will have this decision to make. Is life around us based on that which is only natural, natural processes, philosophy called naturalism, that says matter is all that is, 
it exists. It's here eternally. There is no such thing as a God. The cosmos is a closed system. Human beings are just machines that have developed through evolutionary process. The universe is understood only by science. Or will you believe in that which is supernatural? In an infinite, omnipotent God, who the Bible teaches us is the single cause of all that exists, and the sovereign ruler over everything that he has made. Those are the two choices that you have. Either we came to be through those natural evolutionary processes, or we were created by a God who had the power to say, let there be light, and there was light. Who had the power to say, let us make man in our own image, and formed us from the dust of the earth, like the scripture says. What will it be? You have those decisions to make. And uh, your life depends on it. Because how you answer that question will dictate how you spend your life in this world and in the world to come. Now one thing I want to say to you as you begin uh, your thinking about this is, if you're going to be entering this debate of where we all came from and where we're all going, and whether or not it's uh, based on evolutionary process or God's ability to supernaturally create. You're going to have to become a student of this topic because it's not easy. And uh, you've got to get in and you've got to dig. And you've got to listen. And you've got to study. And you've got to prepare. And one of the things you really have to do is come to terms with the uh, the definition of what we're actually even talking about. You know, for example, I meet with students all the time and we start talking about evolution and I know that you've been inculcated in, in that thinking all through the public school system. And uh, so if you want to talk about evolution and find out, for example, a person like me that doesn't agree with its perspective, I, that I'm a creationist, one of the first things we have to do is even define what terms we're talking about. Because there's a sense in which I can tell you, well, sure, I believe in evolution. If you mean that it's how organisms change over time, everybody believes that. You can watch that happen. That's real. I mean, if that's what science teachers are trying to tell you, that evolution is just how we change over time and how organisms change uh, around a mean variation of living things, well, sure, that's called microevolution. And yeah, I believe that, certainly. But I want to tell you, when you're talking to the scientists of the culture today, that is not the way in which they define the word evolution. And it's which is why I take exception to it. The way evolution is defined by the scientific community today is this. Evolutionists in the scientific community believe that there was a point in time when there was absolutely nothing. There was only inanimate, that is, non-living matter. And through the process of uh, mutation and random chance, this inanimate matter became a single living cell. And from that single living cell, there is a common ancestry to which we have everything that exists, including humankind, plants, animals, and the cosmos beyond. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the way the scientific community believes in evolution today. To which I want to say, can you think of anything more ludicrous? To think, I mean, philosophically speaking, this makes absolutely no sense, that everything came from nothing. Makes absolutely no sense. But that is the position that they take. That is the position called macroevolution, which I cannot abide. I do not believe. I believe in microevolution, change, variation around the mean, or sometimes you, you've heard in your classes here or in your high school classes where we, uh, this term called natural selection. 
And sometimes I hear students talk about natural selection as though it was the meaning of evolution. Natural selection is not the meaning of evolution. And natural selection has been considered by evolutionists to be that mechanism that drives that single molecule to become everything that exists, including all of us. And that's not what natural selection says at all. As a matter of fact, natural selection is a scientific way of thinking that was developed by a creationist, a guy by the name of Edward Blythe, introduced the concept of natural selection. Do I believe in natural selection? Absolutely. Natural selection is true. There is variation around a mean. There is such a thing as microevolution, if by that we mean that change. The ability of organisms to survive. Darwin was right in using that, but it wasn't his term. And Darwin was right in using this term, survival of the fittest. That, in fact, does happen. Organisms change and adapt to their environment. So you see where the, the differences come and how we understand the terms? And people get all concerned and all worked up about what this term is and what this term is mean. If by evolution you simply mean change, variation around the mean, Fixity of species, or as the Bible says, creation according to its kind, then yeah, we can abide that, we can, we can handle that. But to think of evolution in terms of, there at one time was nothing, and it became a living <coughs> single cell that developed through billions and millions of years, through processes of this microevolution that became macroevolution, and everything came into existence from non living matter is absolutely ludicrous. And I want to tell you what scientists today know it. Scientists today know it. My point about that is this if you want to enter the debate, you've got to go in the whole way. And you've got to be able to define your terms. And you've got to be able to learn and to grow in the understanding of what this is all about. I do want you to see what is spiritually at stake, in my view, as it relates to this topic. And this is a wonderful little book, John MacArthur, with Battle from the Beginning. And uh, he quotes a guy by the name of Marvin Lubinall, who writes, The real issue in the creation-evolution debate is not the existence of God. The real issue is the nature of God. To think of evolution as basically atheistic is to misunderstand the uniqueness of evolution. Evolution was not designed as a general attack against theism. It was designed as a specific attack against the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible is clearly revealed in the doctrine of creation. Obviously, if a person is an atheist, it would be normal for him to be an evolutionist. But Evolution is as comfortable with theism as it is atheism. An evolutionist is perfectly free to choose any God he wishes, just as long as it's not the God of the Bible. The gods allowed by evolution are private, subjective, and artificial. They bother no one, and they make absolutely no ethical demands. However, the God of the Bible is a creator, sustainer, savior, and judge, and everybody is responsible to him. He has an agenda that conflicts with human beings. For man to be created in the image of God is awesome. For, him to, for God to be created in the image of man is very comfortable. And that's really true. And that is really what is at stake. The next point I want to uh, make with you is this. If you want in this debate, and uh, you know, I'm not, I am not here to convince evolutionists, you shouldn't believe what you believe. You believe what you want to believe. I'm asking you to confront the evidence. I'm asking you to be intellectual enough, to be brave enough, and I want to tell you it takes an amazing amount of, of intellectual courage today to particularly stand up to science and say, wait just a minute. I am a believer, and this is what the Word of God says, and to anybody who ever tells you that science has disproved the Bible, they are absolutely, categorically, eternally wrong. Science has disproved nothing about the Scripture. Nothing. In fact, I think one of the things you have to learn to do in this debate 
is to stand up and question science. I mean, even as a young person, even as a not quite graduated uh, college student, even though you haven't gone to graduate school, and even though you don't have a PhD, and even though you might not track in these particular scientific ways, I think it is incumbent upon you, it's up to you, and you are capable of questioning the scientific knowledge that is around you right now. I'm going to give you one example. There, is, there are so many examples in the creation-evolution debate where science is found to be suspect. Okay? So many. I want to point to you just one and, and read a couple quotes to you. This is just one issue. And I pick this because evolutionists bank their whole thinking on the fossils record that has been found over the course of time and believe that the story and concept of evolution has been explicated and explained in the fossil record. That's just one of the areas of science where evolutionists take a very strong stand. To which young men and women like you, when you do your homework and you dig in and you find out what's going on, you would be able to say, wait just a minute. Is that really what the fossil record says? Does the fossil record really tell the story of evolution? Does it confirm it? Does it make it true? Does it guarantee its reality? Now I want to read to you a few quotes from evolutionary scientists, not Christians, not believers, not creationists. As a matter of fact, I'll start by reading you a little quote from Darwin himself in his 1859 book that changed the whole world related to this topic. In a little book after he visited the Galapagos Islands, a book called what? Origin of Species. And this is what Darwin said about fossils. He confessed innumerable innumerable transitional forms must have existed. <coughs> Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust on Earth? Why is not every geological formation and stratum full of intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Darwin himself, here's what he's saying. The fossil record doesn't show intermediate stages. It doesn't show this gradual process of this tiny organism here that over the course of time, gradual mutation, random chance, natural selection, survival of the fittest, changed from this organism to this organism, which is what evolution says happened. The record, according to Darwin, was not there. And he was concerned about it. 140 years later, this author says, it has become clear that the fossil record does not confirm Darwin's hope that the future research would fill in the unexpected and extensive gaps in the fossil record. Listen to this quote from Stephen J. Gould, who is probably the foremost paleontologist in the world from Harvard University, himself a staunch evolutionist who said, I quote, the fossil record with all its abrupt transitions offers no support for gradual change. All paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. With an estimated 250 million catalog fossils, the problem does not appear to one be one of an imperfect record. Many scientists have conceded that the fossil data are sufficiently, insufficiently complete to offer a record of evolution. These are scientists who themselves are staunch evolutionists, who in other writings that I have read from them say this, that while the fossil record does not confirm evolution in any way, shape, or form, I prefer, they say, to believe in evolution still because I can't stand the alternative. 
I've read it time and time again. What's the alternative? Creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I could read you, I mean, I have dozens of them, just like this, from top-notch paleontologists and scientists, themselves evolutionists, all over the world, who are, who are saying, as it relates to the science of paleontology and the fossil record, it's not there. As a matter of fact, what does the fossil record show? To the open-minded, clear-minded, thinking, intellectual person, what does the fossil record show? It shows this abrupt, all of a sudden catastrophic something or other that buried millions and at times billions of fossils in one place and alone, in, in one place or another, including fossils of, can you imagine this? How in the world did this happen? The number of fossils being found today from marine animals on the tops of mountains. How in the world did that happen? And what do paleontologists think of that? What happened? It's called the global flood. A flood described in Genesis 6 through 9. The fossil record actually supports the biblical record of how creation happened. There are no transitional forms. Do you see that? Over a quarter of a billion fossil records right now, and there is not, there is nothing that shows one organism changed into another organism, which is the hypothesis of evolution. I want to tell you, this is just one area. And all through the scientific community, and all through the science, you have got to learn to stand up and say, wait just a minute. And I'm telling you, for students, whether they're here or in other institutions, if you're walking away from the Bible because you think science has given, you, uh, given us an assured result of this or that or the other thing, and that science has disproved the Bible, it is just not true. You want to stand up for the Bible, you can stand up for the Bible all day long. If you want to be an evolutionist, that is your choice too. Go to the record and that's how you're convinced then. Believe what you believe. But I am telling you from my vantage point, the Word of God is true, it's accurate, it's clear, and it stands up against every attack that has ever been made against it and will continue to do so. Have the courage to question science. I'm getting close to the end, okay? Hanging on? <laughs> Two or three other points I want to make, and the next one would be this, just simply. You want in this debate, you got to determine how you're going to read the Bible. I mean, I'm watching a lot of kind of stuff going on in our culture and a lot of stuff going on in the Christian culture. And uh, there's been a lot of ways that creationists or people who say they believe in the Word of God have gotten all nervous about what happens in science. In so many ways, they've compromised the simple, straightforward truth of this book. It's happened uh, in relationship to, crea to creation and evolution. It's happened in terms of the Genesis flood. It's happened in terms of the historicity of Adam and Eve. I watch, you, you can watch right now and read all kinds of Christians who are just caving in on the issue, saying, well, science has proven this, and science has proven that. And we gotta read the Bible differently. And so you have any number of people who want to read the book of Genesis say, it's, you know, it's just an allegory. It's just a framework of how we're supposed to read. It's a, really a mythology. It's not historical truth, historically accurate. Oh, I beg to differ. And I want to encourage you. You know, the Bible is greatly profound, greatly mysterious. You will never figure it all out. We never will until we're in heaven someday with the Lord himself. But the Bible is, the old magister, magisterial reformers called it perspicuous. It's clear. And I want to encourage you, when you open the book, though you may not understand it in all its profundity, read it in its simple, straightforward way. And that's how I think you read the beginning of uh, the Bible itself. You know, if God wanted to tell us how this world came to existence, 
and everybody and everything in it. How could he have been more simple and clear than what he did in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth and created everything that exists in six literal days, in my view, over the course of time. And if you know and believe and understand the biblical genealogy, and this will make scientists go right up the wall over a course of between six to 10,000 years. And today, you've been told all your life through uniformitarian philosophy and thinking that the, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and the universe is 14.5 billion years old. And the reason for that is those people need that kind of time for evolution to work. And that kind of time's not there. And there's lots of science that will prove otherwise. And I encourage you to get in the mix. Okay? The last couple of statements I want to make to you is this. First one would be uh, this, and then I'll make my final statement, which I, I promised you a guarantee, right? To show you why this is important. Okay? And I think, above all, athletes are going to understand what I'm going to say in my final point. But my next to final point is this. You really need to understand that both creationism and evolution are matters of faith. Both are. Scientists want you to believe that evolution is a matter of science. It is not a matter of science. It's a matter of faith. If you want to believe in evolution today, you have to have a lot of faith. Because the science is just not there. If you want to believe it, you can believe it. If it seems like the best explanation of how everything came to be and where everything is headed, then believe it. And defend it. And stand up for it. But I'm telling you, the real truth is in the scripture. And that's a matter of faith too. You know, as it comes to the issue of origins, here's why both are a matter of faith. Nobody was there. Science today confirms truth how? By the replication of experimentation to determine that over the course of time, if you keep doing this, you will keep getting this result and they say, this is where science has proven. Interesting thing about science, it changes like crazy. If you've, uh, if you've ever read this book, I want to commend this book to you. It was one of the most important books I ever read in graduate school in my doctoral program by an author by the name of Sir Thomas Kuhn, who wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And I learned in that book how science has changed over time and what it takes to change a paradigm, scientifically speaking. And information changes. What is science? Science is knowledge. Science is human beings studying the environment around them, making postulates about how it all came to be. And evolution is a point of what is known as extrapolation. Darwin looked at those finches and their beaks in the Galapagos Islands and uh, he thought he saw evolution. Because why? The beaks were getting longer, and this was survival of the fittest, and the environment was such that he knew their beaks had to get long so they could continue the species, and they could get food and water and so on. Did, did anybody read the part where the beaks went back? Did you know that's true? They studied the Galapagos Island finches, and uh, after the drought and so on, the beaks go. The beaks go back. Is that devolution? <laughs> Science is a way of looking at the world, and God has gifted us as human beings to think and to observe and to experiment and to understand our world. But when He wanted to, us to understand 